Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast. Large-scale purification of RNA and RNA-based nanoparticles by preparative ultracentrifugation. I am Dr. Chad Schwartz, Senior Application Scientist at Beckman Coulter, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational webinar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter is a leader in centrifugation and flow cytometry and has long been an innovator in particle characterization, lab automation, and genomics. Beckman Coulter products are used at the forefront of important areas of investigation and discovery. For more information, please visit, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Daniel Jasinski. After completion of a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Texas A&M University in 2008, Daniel decided to pursue his interest in research in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Kentucky's College of Pharmacy. He joined the laboratory of Dr. Peishwan Guo in the fall of 2012, coincidentally also my former PhD advisor, a world-renowned investigator in the area, area of bio-nanotechnology. The Guo Lab has pioneered the emerging field of RNA nanotechnology, even hosting a new Gordon Research Conference in 2015 dedicated to advancing this fast-growing field. Daniel's research interests focus on the construction and manipulation of nanoparticles composed ma mainly of RNA, publishing in several high-impact journals. The clinical translation of RNA nanotechnology is hindered by the amounts of purified material needed for treatment. Confronted with this problem, Daniel spent time developing approaches for the large-scale production and purification of RNA nanoparticles, especially ultracentrifugation, which acted to retain the integrity and function of the nanostructures. Before we get started, there are a few poll questions that I would like to ask our audience. Our first question is, do you have hands-on experience with nanoparticle purification? It's a yes or no question. You can click on the button in the gray pool uh, square in front of you. We'll take about 10 seconds, uh, and then we will uh, disseminate the results. It looks like 83% of you do not have any experience with nanoparticle purification. Uh, this presentation will also be about RNA purification, so uh, we will uh, uh, talk about that as well. Uh, so not a problem. The next question uh, relating to RNA purification is which method do you most commonly use? Uh, is it electrophoresis? A lot of people use page gels chromatography, um, size exclusion, or ion exchange, ultracentrifugation, which is today's topic, organic extraction, or I have never purified RNA. Just a few more moments. It looks like 43% have never purified RNA, 28% use organic extraction, 17.9% use electrophoresis, 7% at chromatography, and 3% at ultracentrifugation. So uh, we can definitely uh, um, present our results of ultracentrifugation here and uh, hopefully skew you in that direction. Our third and final question. What are your major concerns when considering different purification techniques? In this one, you can select all that apply, um, purity, yield, time, resources, retention of function. They're all very important uh, concerns. Um, just select some of the ones that are most important to you. Now, 
majority of uh, folks in attendance uh, are concerned with the purity uh, at 38 percent. 27 percent uh, are interested in the yield. Uh, time and resources comes in at 18.2 percent and retention of function at 16.7 percent. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for their answers, and I will now turn it over to Daniel Jasinski for his presentation. Uh, hi, Chad. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, and uh, I appreciate those questions. It gives me some feedback on the kind of audience that is watching today. Um, first, I would like to thank Chad, um, and I would also like to thank Beckman for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all about today about some of the work I've done in uh, Dr. Groves lab here at the University of Kentucky on a large scale, large scale purification of RNA and RNA-based nanoparticles using ultra centrifugation. Um, like Chad said, I am a, I'm just now starting my fourth year as a graduate student here at the University of Kentucky. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to have a broader audience to talk about what I've been doing. Uh, so uh, first, I will be, I'm going to give you guys a kind of a brief outline on what I'll be talking to you about. Um, uh, initially, I'm going to start with some background on RNA. Uh, it seems like people do have some background with RNA that are watching now, uh, but I just want to give an overview for those of you that don't know too much about RNA. Uh, and then I will go into some of the current technologies that are used to purify RNA, um, maybe some issues with, in my opinion, some issues of those technologies um, and how we can improve them by using ultracentrifugation. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the different methods of ultracentrifugation. Um, and, um, and then I will go into talking about some RNA nanoparticle background, which is uh, mostly my expertise, uh, so I can give you some rationale on why we need these methods for RNA purification and for nanoparticle purification. Um, and then finally, I will move into some methods on how um, I will move on to some methods and give you guys an example of purifying some RNA after in vitro transcription, and then purifying a nanoparticle um, after assembling that nanoparticle. Um, so now just some applications of ultracentrifugation. Um, ultracentrifugation has very wide applications in many labs, uh, especially those that do molecular biology, biochemistry, and cell biology. Uh, ultracentrifugation can be broken down into two different areas, uh, analytical ultracentrifugation and preparative ultracentrifugation. An analytical ultracentrifugation ultra is used mainly to actually study your molecule, whether that be uh, molecular interactions such as RNA protein interactions. Um, you can also study the physical properties of the particle, such as molecular weight, its shape and conformation. And using all this, you can, you, you can determine its sedimentation coefficient, which also relates to the molecular weight and its shape and conformation. Um, but the ultracentrifugation method I will be focusing on in, my, in, in this webinar today is preparative ultracentrifugation, mainly isolating and purifying specific particles. Um, in this case, that particle will be RNA. So what is RNA? Uh, RNA can be described as the carrier of information in the cell. The central dogma of molecular biology is DNA to RNA to protein. RNA translate, translates the genetic information in DNA to protein for those, and then those proteins carry out their uh, roles, whatever they may be. Um, mo the, all the, the RNA or the DNA in the genome is transcribed into RNA, and the messenger RNA, also known as mRNA, is what actually trans uh, codes for proteins. However, not all of the DNA genome codes for mRNA. About more than 98.5% of the DNA genome is actually not coded into, into uh, it's actually not transcribed into RNA that codes for proteins. It's transcribed into non-coding RNAs, also for short, NCRNAs. 
these NC RNAs, they display various functions uh, throughout the cell, including gene regulation, um, such as uh, miRNA. This can um, cause different, uh, it can do different processes in the cell, goes through different processing, and it can upregulate or downregulate the transcription, or the, rather the translation of certain proteins. Um, it can also act as catalytic RNA, such as ribozymes, which perform um, chemical reaction very similar to that of proteins. And it's involved in many other uh, cell cellular and biological processes in the cell. And I'll give a little more uh, detail on that later. Um, so what does RNA look like? The structure of RNA is very similar to that of DNA. It is made up of, it's a polymer made up of four different bases. Um, adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. There's actually a typo on my slide. Um, but anyways, the, uh, the structure is very similar to that of DNA, where it's, there's a phosphate backbone linking the ribose sugars at the five, at, at the, uh, five and three prime carbons. And then off of the one prime carbon is your base. Um, that's where the ACGU are located. Um, one major difference between RNA and DNA is at the two prime position. In RNA, there is a two prime hydroxyl group, whereas in DNA, there is a there is no hydroxyl group. It's just uh, two hydrogens off of that two prime position. Um, so this two prime hydroxyl is a lot of what um, gives RNA some of its uh, functionality and it's really its flexibility. But at the same time, it also makes RNA very susceptible to exonucleases and endonucleases in the cell, which can use this 2' hydroxyl to attack the phosphate backbone and will actually cleave your RNA. Um, so this has kind of hindered RNA's use um, in vivo um, due to its ease of degradation. It's very susceptible this unmodified RNA. Uh, however, much research has been done to overcome this process, including some work in my lab, in Dr. Pejuan Go's lab, to um, help overcome this instability of RNA so that it could be used as an in vivo therapeutic. Um, one major um, modification that can be made to this RNA is a, two, is a two prime fluorine substitution on the pyrimidine. So on C and U, you replace the two prime hydroxyl with a fluorine. And this renders your RNA um, more chemically stable, more thermodynamically stable, and um, more importantly, enzymatically stable. So this two prime F, we call it two prime F modification, actually decreases its um, susceptibility to degradation by nucleases in the cell. So because of this, um, over the past five to 10 years, RNA has garnered great attention as far as um, therapeutics, whether it be sRNA, or targeting molecules, these um, things such as RNA aptamers, you can select uh, a random RNA sequence for a specific protein and it will target that cell. And because of the 2 prime F modification, it can be used in vivo to target specific um, cell receptors and therefore target different tumors and cancers. Um, so RNA, there's also, besides the in vivo work, in uh, therapeutic work, which is what um, our lab here works on. Um, lots of people um, study RNA structure, the RNA function in relation to its structure. Um, RNA has very diverse structure and folding, and many studies on RNA have elucidated various functions of RNA, such as uh, transfer RNA, which decodes the mRNA to amino acids, um, messenger RNA, which contains the code for proteins, um, ribosomal RNA, which is part of the ribosome and is essential to protein synthesis. Um, ribozymes, which are catalytic RNAs uh, similar to that of proteins. They um, perform um, uh, certain chemical reactions in the cell. And then riboswitches is another one. And these are actually can be part of an mRNA sequence. Um, and they're regulatory RNAs, so a small molecule will bind to these switches, and it can, can cause it to enhance the um, production of protein from a certain mRNA, or it can cause it to downregulate the production of protein from a certain mRNA. So because of these various functions and the huge diversity in RNA uh, structure and function, many efforts are being put towards the sequence-based structure prediction. 
However, um, in most cases, these uh, structure predictions are not perfect. So until they become perfect, uh, wet lab experiments need to be, um, need to confirm these predictions. Um, and a lot of this is done by um, assays such as uh, NMR or crystallization. And um, techniques like this require huge amounts of RNA, um, um, milligram amounts, which may not sound like huge amounts, but for RNA, it's quite a bit. Um, so because of that, um, we definitely need enhanced ways to create large amounts of RNA so that we can enhance the field of RNA research. Um, so like I said earlier, RNA can also be used as a therapeutic. Um, in the cell, there's these special double-stranded RNAs, um, which are processed by, an, in, by a protein called dicer, and this dicer cleaves these specific strands into short double-stranded RNAs called siRNAs. And then these siRNAs bind to other protein complex called the risk complex, and this risk complex is then guided to MR, mRNA by this specific siRNA sequence and then this causes cleavage of the target mRNA. So cleavage of the target mRNA means no protein production. So as opposed to certain small molecule drugs that um, maybe target the protein specifically to stop its production, siRNA works a step above that and tries to just stop protein production completely. Um, the siRNA has shown um, much promise over the last years, or the last couple of years, and is seen as the next generation of drug discovery. Because theoretically, um, every mRNA could be a target for this siRNA. So um, a lot of the work in my lab uh, focuses on using this siRNA in in vitro model systems and also in in vivo models. Uh, as mice specifically, we use this uh, siRNA to knock down uh, the production of certain proteins. And because this is RNA, um, we retain a quite big advantage um, by using RNA-based nanoparticles. It's easy for us to incorporate these RNAs directly into our nanoparticle. So that gives us a huge reason to develop these large-scale um, production techniques for RNA and RNA nanoparticles. Uh, so how is RNA made? Um, I would say the most, one of the most common methods um, is using uh, um, uh, transcription machinery that um, is like isolated from E. coli, for example, the T7 RNA polymerase. Um, another popular method, one we also use in our lab, is using chemical synthesis. It's the same uh, method used as DNA chemical synthesis. This also yields large amounts of RNA. However, the, uh, the length of chemical synthesis is limited to about 60 nucleotides just based on the uh, coupling efficiency of the phosphoramidite chemistry with RNA. So for longer RNA transcripts, enzymatic synthesis is definitely the most efficient process. However, after the in vitro synthesis, you're not only left with your target, in, or your target RNA strand, you are left with your proteins, you're left with NTPs that do not get incorporated into the RNA, and you're also left with your DNA template. So these all need to be removed from the transcription mixture before the RNA can be used. Um, so some current technologies, and as a lot of you uh, know, because um, you all answered the poll questions and all three of these were on there, except over transcription. Um, the, uh, there's gel electrophoresis, HPLC and FPLC and organic extraction. Uh, these methods definitely do have their limits. Um, I've worked with page gels now for my entire time here. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, page gels are limited by uh, what you can do with them. For example, they're not very scalable. If you want to do a very large scale transcription, you just, uh, in most cases, have to increase the amount of gels you run. Um, so that's just more work and more time. Uh, and then there's also, also multiple workup steps. Um, you know, you have to cut the gel out, you have to cut up the gel pieces, and you have to do an elution step. And a lot of times the elution from the gel is not great. So the yield from transcription may be 
good, but the yield you get from your page gels is not very good. Now you can increase your yield from the gel extraction by uh, crushing up your gel pieces very small, um, but then you're left with contamination from these gel pieces after you extract them from the gel. So uh, that that can cause some, definitely can cause some issues when doing studies on your RNA. Um, now HPLC, it's, it's a very good method, especially for um, modified oligos from like a chemical synthesizer with a fluorophore, uh, works very well to purify large amounts of that. Uh, but for um, RNA after transcription, um, the resolution is very limited. And then if you want to purify actual nanoparticles, uh, HPLC or FPLC, it's not that great for these large particles. Um, a lot of the particles we make, as you will see later, are branched. Uh, their RNA itself is pretty flexible, so it can adopt multiple conformations. So this will affect its elution time off of the column, and you'll end up with a low yield because you miss out on your fraction collection, or you will get a impure product, which is a, a big concern when we're trying to get reproducible result, results, especially in vivo. And there's also organic extraction, which is used quite commonly. Um, however, uh, I believe it's quite easy to get solvent contamination and then your sample can also get uh, degraded, which um, while it does decrease your yield, it also introduces impurity in your sample. So why would we use ultracentrifugation to purify RNA? Uh, ultracentrifugation has lots of advantages over some of these other methods. Um, it's very efficient sample recovery. There's no extraction um, step. You simply, uh, after you fractionate uh, your, if you fractionate your gradient, um, all you do is do some type of dialysis or um, ethanol precipitation to remove your salts. Um, there's multiple methods of separation, and you can do, uh, as I'll show you on the next slide, I think. Um, there's multiple um, types of gradients you can use, so it's widespread applicability. Um, we can do large-scale preparation. The method I outlined in this webinar uses five milliliter tubes, but this is a very scalable method. You can definitely scale it up to larger tubes. Um, uh, it's contamination-free as long as you, um, you know, work to prevent any degradation of your natural RNA. Then it's very, it's um, relatively easy to keep contamination-free, and then also your RNA will retain its biological activity because most of this is just carried out in different salt solutions and RNA is very stable in most salts. Um, so this is just a slide showing some basic ultra centrifugation concepts. Uh, there's three main types of um, preparative ultra centrifugation used. There's differential, uh, which is pelleting. So this is very similar to doing an ethanol precipitation and then just spinning down your RNA or DNA sample to the bottom. So the way that works is it fractionates according to shape and size. Um, it's used a lot for the separation and enrichment of organelles and cells or organelle cells or proteins from like a whole cell sample. Like after you would lyse a cell, you would spin down cells and it's used a lot for that kind of stuff. Um, then there's equilibrium density gradients. Um, this is used to separate particles by their density, which works very well for RNA um, because it's very much more dense than proteins and even more than DNA. So after you do your in vitro transcription, all you do is load your sample in and then because of RNA's high density, it will separate to the bottom and you can get a pure product. So this actually works by you put your sample in and then as you spin, as you centrifuge your sample, the gradient forms and your particles migrate based on their density. And then the, uh, the last one I will talk about is uh, rate zonal ultra centrifugation. So this, uh, this is kind of similar to the, the principle of, of a gel. It's the same type of thing uh, where the, the particles flow continuously in this rate zonal gradient. And then uh, um, they, ba they separate based on their sedimentation rate. So larger particles will sediment faster than smaller particles. 
So you will be able to separate your particles based on size. Um, and that works very well for the RNA nanoparticles because in our case, we're, when we make a nanoparticle, it's a mixture of multiple single strands, then they form a specific size and shaped nanoparticle. And then we put them in this gradient and they are able to separate based on size. And we basically we separate our unannealed monomer strands from our formed nanoparticles. So, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, choosing the correct gradient. Um, it's relatively important, and this is, can probably be one of the most uh, difficult parts of the ultracentrifugation process, is choosing the gradient you're going to use. Um, when First, you need to decide what kind of sol solute you want to use. Um, the solute needs to be inert to your sample and must have no interaction with your sample or else that could cause degradation or it could change its sedimentation rate based on these interactions, and you wouldn't know that until after you did it. Um, you need to choose the correct buffer conditions. Uh, for example, RNA, like I discussed earlier, is susceptible to degradation by RNases, the nucleases. However, these nucleases are divalent metal ion dependent. So whenever we do this, we, we do this in uh, TE buffer, a buffer that contains EDTA, so it will chelate these divalent metal ions and prevent the degradation of your RNA. Um, and then also, it's it it's kind of goes throughout um, the this entire presentation is it's very important to use sterilized and autoclaved reagents. Um, in our lab, we always autoclave all of our tips, our tubes, um, our buffers. Um, it just you need to do that to make sure you prevent degradation of your samples. Um, also, another important part is that this um, your solute needs to be easily removed from your sample. You don't want to use a, a solute that you don't think you're going to be able to uh, separate from your sample, because then you'll, your sample will have that for its entirety, and it might be useless depending on what you're trying to do with your sample. And the next important thing, this applies more to rate zonal is um, the, uh, your gradient choice. Um, so the way the rate zonal works is you should always choose a density of your sucrose solution, which is what um, we use for the rate zonal uh, ultracentrifugation. You should always use a density that is less dense than your particle. Um, that way, your particles never stop. Because if your particles stop at a certain density, they will all um, aggregate together, and then you're left over with an unpurified sample, so you're back to the start. So a lot of times, um, optimization will be required for the gradient you will need to use. So depending on your method of detection, whether it be uh, absorbance, fluorescence, um, maybe some tritium labels, so you could use the um, radioactive signal, um, you can always start with a small scale and you can run six samples at a time in the SW55 rotor from Beckman. So you can try different uh, gradients and optimize your conditions first and then load your entire sample before you will purify. So that way you know you end up with the pure sample. So now I'm going to move on and talk about um, my area of expertise, which would be uh, RNA nanotechnology. Um, so RNA nanotechnology was first, um, the proof of concept was first done back in 1998 when my advisor, Dr. Peishuang Guo, um, re-engineered the hexameric RNA in, from the uh, bacteriophage 529 DNA packaging motor. So from then on till now, um, the lab has worked very diligently to um, you know, translate these nanoparticles to where we can use them in vivo and make them stable and make them useful. So, till now we have constructed therapeutic RNA nanoparticles that are chemically stable, thermodynamically stable, and that also display favorable pharmacological um, profiles. In other words, when we inject them in mice, uh, they accumulate in the tumor without um, any detectable toxicity in the um, uh, healthy organs. So um, 
this is the bacteriophage 529 DNA packaging motor. You can see on the diagram on the left, the packaging motor is made up of a procapsid, which is a protein shell. Um, it's made up also of a connector protein, which serves as the portal protein for the double-stranded DNA, the DS DNA, to go through. And then below the, or connected to the connector protein, is a, the pRNA molecules, which actually help to gear the packaging of the uh, DNA. So the diagram on the right is the uh, secondary structure and sequence of this pRNA molecule. You can see that the, um, this pRNA molecule has some unique structural features, um, including loops and some bulges. So uh, the ones we exploit and use to make nanoparticles are the right-hand loop at the top and the left-hand loop. Um, and you can also use the foot down here to fabricate different nanoparticles. Um, also, outlined in red is uh, the three-way junction core. Um, this uh, three-way junction has been shown to be exceptionally thermodynamically stable, chemically stable. We've used it in vivo. It's, we found it to be the most stable natural three-way junction um, out there compared to any other ones, including like the 5S RNA and the M2 bacteriophage three-way junction. So basically, we've, we've taken advantage of what happens to be a very stable uh, three-way junction motif, and we've used it as an in vivo drug delivery vehicle. Um, so it's, it's shown to be very successful, so that's kind of uh, the direction we're headed right now. But some other work in the lab um, uses these packaging RNA, which is pRNA molecules, to construct these different nanoparticles. And um, one of our postdocs in the lab put in a lot of work to develop these three toolkits to um, construct these um, pRNA nanoparticles. So the toolkit one is what she calls hand-in-hand -hand interaction. In other words, you exploit these right-hand and left-hand loop that I just talked about on the previous slide, and you exploit them to create these different shaped nanoparticles, um, or not different shaped, but uh, different particles based on these pRNA. And we do that by increasing this, naturally the pRNA has a four nucleotide loop. However, we can um, artificially increase its stability by extending these loop to seven nucleotide overlap. So that just gives it more base pairing and enhances the stability of these particles. So the second toolkit is what uh, she calls foot-to-foot -foot interaction. In other words, you link these two pRNA molecules together by complementary sticky ends. And the third one is what she calls branch extension. Um, so that's, like I mentioned earlier, using this three-way junction particle um, to extend off of uh, helix 1 and helix 2 and helix 3, um, extending it to create different nanoparticles. And as you can see, we also have um, this X-way motif, um, which was actually developed by one of my collaborators for uh, this present, this webinar, the date in this webinar, Farzan Hawk. Um, so here are some um, nanoparticles that have been made using these three toolkits. Um, and we, we have some great collaborators at the University of Nebraska Medical Center that have, uh, or the College of Pharmacy, that have helped us to get these uh, great AFM images of all these really, really cool looking um, RNA nanoparticles. So you can see in the top, um, bracketed by hand-in-hand -in -hand interactions, uh, we can make trimers, tetramers, pentamers, hexamers, heptamers, all just based on um, base pairing of these loops that I just showed you guys. And then using the foot-to-foot -foot interaction, you can extend the complexity even more and make these foot-to-foot -foot trimers. So you're using your, you're combining foot-to-foot -foot and hand-to-hand -to, -hand to make these diverse shaped nanoparticles. And what, basically what this does for us is this gives us the polyvalency and we can attach multiple functional groups to each of these particles. For example, the pRNA chimera that was uh, featured in human gene therapy in 2005. This was kind of the very beginning of the, uh, the therapeutic research in the lab. So you can use these pRNAs and you can attach different things such as uh, RNA aptamers, sRNA ribozymes, miRNA, 
and detection and detection molecules and chemical ligand groups. And then you take each of these pRNAs through the, the toolkit interactions, and you can create these multivalent nanoparticles that perform multiple functions in the cell. Um, another, um, another route to engineering nanoparticles, one that I was heavily involved in, is using this three-way junction uh, nanoparticle, or the three-way junction motif itself, and using um, what's, what we term as RNA biomimetics, um, and using this three-way junction to construct these different shaped nanoparticles. Um, so here, if, for example, if you look at the triangular nanoparticle, we actually used uh, molecular modeling and constructed this triangle from three pRNA three-way junctions. And then we extended that even more just by simply adding an additional strand of RNA. Um, then we can make a square nanoparticle using four three-way junctions. And then we can also make a uh, pentagonal shaped nanoparticle using five three-way junctions. Um, and we have the AFM images and we see very distinct and compact nanoparticles and our dynamic light scattering data shows very uniform um, shape and size. Um, so because of this, um, this is what kind of why ultra centrifugation is perfect for um, us to use to purify these nanoparticles because they will all migrate distinctly um, based on their sedimentation rates. And so we've also been able to, you know, uh, very finely control the size of these nanoparticles based on the number of nucleotides alone. Um, so if you see, you can start with the pRNA through a junction, um, and we created a small square, a medium square, and a large square, all designed on a computer to be 20, 10, and 5 nanometers respectively um, along the edge from large to small. And then um, based on our AFM and our DLS data, we get particles that are very similar in size to what we actually designed. So um, using this method, we can very easily generate different size and different shape nanoparticles, which have some great applications um, for in vivo work. And that's actually something that we're exploring pretty intently right now. Um, so now I mentioned the in vivo use of these nanoparticles. Well, this is actually the, the pRNAx motif that I showed you earlier developed by Dr. Hawk. And um, so they injected these particles uh, by tail vein injection. And you can see after four and eight hours, our pRNAx particle accumulates in the tumor. And then after eight hours, um, it stays in the tumor and you can see no healthy organs show any sign of fluorescence. So um, that's, that's where we're headed with our RNA nanoparticle te particle technology. And that's why it was so important for me to develop these methods for the large scale uh, purification. So now to start with um, these methods. The first step is to purify your single-stranded RNA. So following a large-scale transcription, uh, say one or two mLs, um, you should get quite a bit of RNA. So rather than using PAGE or FPLC, um, we want to use this ultra-centrifugation to purify these particles. Um, so the, this one here is using a cesium chloride equilibrium density gradient. Um, so the way this works is you basically, you mix in your sample to the medium density cesium chloride, pipette that in, and then you load your high and your low density uh, cesium chloride. And after ultra centrifugation, your gradient forms and your particles separate based on their density. Um, so here's a somewhat detailed uh, protocol, like I just, I just mentioned earlier. Um, some important things to uh, um, uh, remember when doing things like this um, is you, you want to try and pipette these solutions in very slowly. Um, you don't want to disturb the, the gradient in between each because then that will affect how well uh, your density gradient forms while centrifuging. And that's the most important part because, as you're, like, I, like I said, as your gradient forms, your particles move with the gradient. So if you have a very uniform gradient, you should get a good, um, a good purification of your RNA. Um, so RNA being the most dense molecule in the solution compared to um, the proteins and then 
So in your solution, you'll have proteins, you'll have salts, and you'll have RNTPs from the transcription mixture that didn't get incorporated into the RNA, and then you'll have DNTPs as well because um, that will be degraded by uh, DNAs after your transcription. So RNA will be the most dense molecule in your solution, and it will migrate to the most dense portion of the gradient, which is uh, the bottom. Uh, so after you do um, your ultracentrifugation, you will take fractions of, it depends on the resolution you want, 200 to 300 microliters is normally fine. Um, and then what you do is you'll collect these fractions from the top, um, being careful to take it from, take it directly from the top so you can keep your resolution as high as possible. And then you just, you can, uh, I have uh, gel analysis shown here so you can take a, a quick, run a quick agarose gel um, or you could use, you could try to do the um, absorbance measurements, however your nucleotides will also absorb. So it's best to do some type of gel analysis with, here is um, ethidium bromide staining. So you can see um, I have some real data here at the bottom right um, from purifying the pRNA monomer. Um, and you can see that uh, the direction of sedimentation is from left to right. So my fraction 17 was the most dense and my fraction 1 was the least dense. So you can see the RNA migrates to the most dense um, portion of the gradient. So after uh, sample collection, you want to combine, combine all your particles. And then now a, a big, this is a, a big step, or an important step rather, is to, you need to remove the cesium chloride from your sample. Because that could affect, um, and for us it will affect, the salt concentration, concentration uh, definitely affects the assembly process and the uh, yield of assembly for our nanoparticles. So um, there's... There's two, there's really, there's two options you can do. If you want to remove the cesium chloride from all of your sample at once, you can do bag dialysis and um, you can dialyze your RNA into a TRIS EDTA buffer. Um, so TRIS EDTA is a good buffer to store your sample in because uh, like I mentioned earlier, it chelates any divalent um, metal ions that promote the cleavage of the RNA by nucleases. Or it's perfectly fine if you want to store your sample in cesium chloride. For example, if you want to do a, a huge transcription and purification, but you only need like a little bit of sample at a time, you can freeze it in your cesium chloride and then you can uh, just take aliquots out as you need them and perform a quick drop dialysis, which is just using a, a dialysis membrane and you can take 10 to 15 microliters of your sample and dialyze it into uh, TRIS EDTA and then your cesium chloride should also be removed that way. So after, sorry, after, um, after RNA purification, uh, the next step is nanoparticle assembly. So uh, there's two different types of nanoparticles are two different types of uh, formation processes that we use in our lab. Uh, the one down here on the left, which would be all, for all the nanoparticles made from the Fourier junction, is um, what we call a thermal denaturation and slow cooling process. So you mix all of your strands in equal molar amount, uh, put them in a tube, then you can use a thermocycler, and you heat all of the, uh, you heat the strands up so they're all thermally denatured, not base paired, and then you slowly cool it to four degrees over about an hour, and then you'll get um, the formation of these nanoparticles. Um, another, another way to do it is, um, and this pertains to the pRNA nanoparticles on the bottom right of the slide, um, is just mixing of your pRNA, your different pRNAs in the presence of a magnesium, of magnesium ions. And this, ma these magnesium ions promote the interaction between the left and right hand loop of the particles. So um, after the annealing process um, is now when we actually move to the purification of the particles. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a very good method for us to use for this is rate zonal purification based on the uniformity of size and shape of our particles. We're basically trying to purify our assembled nanoparticles from 
are non-annealed single-strand oligomers. Um, like I said earlier, um, it's always important to make sure that you are using sterilized reagents when making your sucrose solutions. Uh, bacteria can grow in the sucrose solutions, so it's probably best to store your solutions at four degrees, four degrees, or make them fresh each time would not hurt either. Um, and so as a proof of uh, this concept, um, I'm going to show you guys uh, some, some methods I developed to purify the pRNA monomer and dimer constructs. All right, so first, the first thing you need to do for the rate zonal is a gradient preparation. So this is one method to prepare your gradient, and it's by manual layering. So basically, you, pre you, um, you prepare four solutions of sucrose, uh, 5, 10, 15, and 20 percent weight to volume, um, and this is in 1x TMS buffer because remember our pRNA particles are their formation is dependent on the magnesium ions. Um, so uh, this is just an example of a 5 to 20. If you wanted to do a 5 to 30, you would want to make uh, four evenly spaced um, density gradients, and then you want to and then you want to carefully layer each of them into your tube, starting with the least dense. So you will put your 5% solution in first, and then you take a syringe with a long needle, and you put the needle to the bottom of the tube, and slowly uh, syringe in another 1.2 milliliters of your 10% solution. And so this 10% solution will then go to the bottom, beneath the 5, and then you repeat this twice with the 15 and then with the 20. Um, this helps to uh, keep your resolution in between your layers for now uh, of your um, four different um, density sucrose solutions um, because it's, it's important to keep the, keep the solutions separate. So you need to pipette this slowly and you need to take, good, take care when you're doing this. Um, and then um, to form the gradient, you'll actually incubate in four degrees overnight and all your, um, your layers will slowly merge together to form a continuous gradient. Um, but for us in the lab, we have a automated gradient maker. Uh, so to do that, um, all you do is you make your two different sucrose solutions. Um, for example, here we're making a 5 to 20% gradient, so we have a 5% sucrose solution and we have a 20% sucrose solution. And then from, from uh, for this solution, for this gradient rather, you um, rotate it for one minute, 13 seconds at 86 degrees tilt at 16 RPMs. Um, this will be different for every gradient. So if you have a gradient maker, refer to your um, manufacturer's protocol for your desired gradient. But it will always be, uh, it will always be your least dense to your most dense. So for example, if you're making again the 5 to 30% gradient, you would load in your 5% first followed by 30% sucrose of 2.4 milliliters of each and then follow the protocol of the manufacturer. Um, so another good option when you're running a sucrose gradient is to use a, a sucrose cushion um, so what a sucrose cushion does is that um, it prevents the pelleting of your larger of larger particles that are that may happen to be more dense than you expect. Um, pelleting uh, it can be bad for nanoparticles um, because if they get too aggregated, they will you know, they'll form a obviously they'll form a pellet and they'll be become aggregated and this can lead to some degradation of your particles. Um, so to form a sucrose cushion, um, you form your gradient first. Let me stress that. You form your gradient first, and then you take a 60% sucrose solution, and you can take, you take your long needle, and you pipette it to the bottom of your tube. And what you end up with is your 5 to 20% gradient, followed by a 60% cushion. And um, so... This just helps to prevent any pelleting of your nanoparticles, which is not good for them. Um, so then uh, the sample loading of this is different than the cesium chloride one. 
for the cesium chloride gradient, you were you loaded your sample into the actual gradient. Um, but for the rate zonal, you actually preform your gradient and then load your sample on top. And uh, I have a schematic here on the left. So um, you load your particles on top, and after centrifugation, you should get a separation based on your uh, particle size. For example, the, the single-stranded RNA monomers at the top of the tube, and then the single cubes in the middle of the tube, followed by the uh, what would be aggregates of multiple cubes at the bottom. So in this case, my target is actually the single cubes. So after you centrifuge, um, you can do um, agarose gel analysis. And basically what you should see is um, when, you, when you have just your single-stranded RNA ligamers, they will migrate the fastest. Then as you get to your cubes, so your target particle, they will migrate um, slower than the single-stranded, but uh, still a lot faster than your aggregated. So basically you run a gel, and, and from that gel, determine uh, which fractions you're going to collect. And then um, as far as sample, as far as fraction collection goes, it's the same process as the cesium uh, chloride. You can do dialysis, or you could even do an ethanol uh, precipitation step to remove um, most, if not all, of your sucrose solution. Um, so then after this dialysis or um, ethanol precipitation step, um, it's important, it was important for me at least for proof of concept to verify the biological activity of the cesium chloride, or the cesium chloride um, purified RNAs and, um, yeah, to verify the biological activity of the cesium chloride purified RNA. Um, so what you see on the very left is the difference in the structure between a pRNA monomer and a pRNA dimer. And then in the middle is, um, the, uh, is a plot of the absorbance of the fractions from a rate zonal gradient purification of in black the monomer and in red the dimer. So you can see, uh, like I said earlier, our particles form very, very high efficiently, high efficiency, and they are very distinct size. So it enables us to get our particles out in a very low uh, number of fractions. And then on the right is a polycrylamide gel uh, showing the comparison of lanes one through three, which are uh, lanes one and two are the two monomers, AB prime and BA prime, we call them. Uh, they're purified by cesium chloride ultracentrifugation. Lane three is the dimer that is assembled and purified by sucrose ultracentrifugation. And then lanes four, five, and six are that done, is that done, that same process, but done by traditional uh, page, page gels. So you can see that we get a very comparable, uh, it's actually identical results to page. Um, so Basically, we don't lose any biological activity, and we're able to get larger amounts from this ultracentrifugation. Um, so, just in summary, uh, I've kind of I've kind of talked to you guys about uh, why I think RNA is great, and why we need these different methods for the large-scale uh, production of not only single-stranded RNA, but of also the RNA oligomers. And uh, I hope I've convinced you that. Uh, this ultra centrifugation method can be used as a better alternative to PAGE or HPLC. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Peishwan Guo, and my collaborators, uh, Dr. Chad Schwartz, who I would also like to thank for moderating this uh, webinar for me. And as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Farzan Haq, uh, another collaborator that helped me with this work. And then I would also like to thank all my other lab members pictured here and, um, and also the University of Kentucky and NIH funding that helped fund this work. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that highly informative presentation, Daniel. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience that you can still submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the lower left of the presentation window. 
Uh, we had several uh, very good uh, questions come in uh, today. Uh, one listener uh, was asking for a method to separate single-stranded RNA from double-stranded RNA. Um, we talked a little bit about that during the presentation, and uh, the listener is interested in obtaining a percent of single-stranded RNA in their double-stranded RNA uh, solution. Can you uh, give us a little insight there, Daniel? Um, well, I can definitely tell you that uh, using the cesium chloride, um, uh, the density method that you will definitely be able to separate the single-stranded from double-stranded. Um, the only thing I could say is that um, if your single-stranded RNA does form some type of secondary structure to where it is uh, single-stranded, or to where it acts more like a double-stranded RNA, then uh, the separation uh, resolution not be that great. So you need to make sure that you use some type of denaturing uh, reagent in your sample to make sure your single-stranded RNA is actually single-stranded. Um, as far as a percent, uh, I think that's probably sample-specific. I'm not really sure. I, I can um, offer you an exact percent number on that. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, our next question is in regards to uh, designing nanoparticles. Um, how does one uh, start? Um, is this based on a secondary structure? Um, is there some bioinformatics involved? Uh, just give us a little bit of uh, introduction into uh, designing RNA-based nanoparticles. OK. Uh, OK. That is a, uh, that's a good question, actually. So for, uh, in our lab at all, it started from the actual, from the period junction nanoparticle. We were trying to have something uh, small and compact that could possibly be used, as an, be used as an in vivo delivery particle. So it started with investigating the stability of this period junction, um, if it could actually be used. So once we determined that it was um, very stable, surprisingly stable actually, um, we basically were seeking to expand the diversity on the size and the shape of nanoparticles um, because that affects its properties in vivo as far as circulation time, accumulation in healthy organs, toxicity. But I would say if, um, if you're going to start from the ground up designing a nanoparticle, um, we didn't use any bioinformatics. We just did some computer modeling using the Swiss PDB viewer to manually construct these particles. Um, so I would say, as a logical way, um, start with some uh, stable RNA motif. Um, RNA motifs are very sequence uh, dependent. If the sequence is the same, uh, it will fold, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say 100% of the time, but it will fold with very high efficiency in its um, in this actual confirmation, for example, the three-ray junction. Uh, the way we construct those nanoparticles, it's not, the three-ray junction is not by itself. It's, um, it's incorporated into these external strands of the particles. Um, you can actually look at the, we have two publications in ECS Nano uh, detailing the construction methods, but um, we found that this three-ray junction actually drives the formation of these particles. So I would just say you could start with a, a motif, some type of RNA motif, and kind of go from there to um, expand it. And you could really, you, may, you probably wouldn't even need to use a motif. The, the base pairing of RNA is, um, when you fabricate it yourself, can be very predictable. But it also helps to start from the building block, like, an RNA, like a, some RNA motif like we did with uh, free rate junction.
Perfect. Thanks again. Um, one more question uh, is, what is the purity of the RNA uh, that you can reach using ultracentrifugation? Um, and are there any uh, deleterious effects uh, of cesium chloride uh, after purifying using uh, this method? Um, I would say the, the purity of the RNA is pretty high. Uh, if you look at the slide here, I don't know if you can still see it, but the, the two bands in lanes one and two compared to four and five by traditional page are very, very similar to that by page. So I would say uh, if, if you think page purity is good enough, then I would definitely think that ultra centrifugation uh, purity is good enough. Um, and as far as cesium chloride in vivo, I can't say for certain, but I assume that it, it would not do good things in vivo. Um, so there could be some side effects. Um, but I would just say, you know, do, you could do multiple, multiple dialysis steps uh, or you know, dialyze it overnight or after you form your particles, dialyze it again. The dialysis should remove the cesium chloride pretty easily. You just may need to do multiple steps if you want to be 100% sure that it's, uh, it's out. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, and of course, Daniel Jasinski for making today's educational webcast possible, which will also be available for on-demand viewing through BeckmanCoulter.com. Thanks again. Goodbye. <laughs>